Is your content marketing not really driving results? It could be that the content isn't actually resonating with your ideal buyers. And the reason for that is most likely that your content marketing team, the members of that team, have never sat in the seats that your buyers sit in. They've never served as CMOs or VPs of sales, and yet they're trying to create content for people that sit in those seats today. Well, check out this conversation with Pete Caputa, CEO of Databox. He knows a thing or two about partner marketing, obviously, in his days and building the partner program at HubSpot from the early days there. Now, for several years, they have been able to create thousands of pieces of content with tens of thousands of contributors, all of whom fit the buyer persona that they're trying to reach. So this is a great example of how marketing together can help you create greater content. And they do all of this without a huge marketing team. All right, with that, let's get into the conversation. Welcome, welcome to Marketing Together. I'm Logan Lyles, Head of Partnerships at Teamwork. I'm your host, and I'm joined today by the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Pete Caputa, CEO at Databox. Pete, good to be talking to you again, and good to be recording it again. Thanks for joining me, man. Uh, thank you, Logan. It's always uh, always have fun uh, chatting, chatting partner marketing with you, or doing partner marketing with you. <laughs> yes, doing it, talking it. it it's always meta, uh, you know. And uh, you guys and the team at Databox were recognized at, at PLX um, as uh, partner-led startup of the year. And so, as we're kicking off marketing together uh, in the Partner Hacker network of of shows, I just thought, man, I've got to chat with Peter, Pete again uh, and talk about this concept that you and I have talked about. I've seen you and your director of marketing, John. Benini talk about, and that is the distinction in marketing as a marketer and as a marketing team, marketing like a journalist rather than uh, marketing as a columnist. So let's just start right there. This concept for folks who haven't heard this distinction before and how it's going to play out, we're going to get into the tactics of how you guys have been able to create a ton of content uh, with a small marketing team, how you've been able to crowdsource a, a lot of that content and involve your audience. But before we get into the how and how people can replicate what you guys have been able to do, uh, what do you mean? What is it mean to market like a journalist versus a columnist? Yeah, so I have to give uh, credit for uh, John to John Bonini, our director of marketing at, at Databox, for like coming up with the succinct way of explaining that. He's got a journalism degree and he's been a content marketer for a while. And so he's the one that's like columnist versus journalist. I'm like, oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, so sim you know, simple, brilliant uh, way of communicating. Um, I think most, but like to explain or unpack what we do and and uh, and what we mean by that is, uh, I think most content marketers are sitting down with a pen and paper and some keyword data and like Google, uh, and they're writing content. Uh, it's either from their own personal experience or what they've read that they're repackaging. Um, or, you know, if it's a highly technical product, maybe they're sitting down with one or two subject matter experts, pulling the, enough out of them to represent the company's perspective and put that out there. Uh, when, when, um, uh, when, when we talk about it, we prefer to do a lot of primary research where we're interviewing or asking for input from lots of people uh, in order to create what we call also multi-perspective content. So it's not about getting our perspective out into the market. It's about getting the perspective of multiple people, sometimes with varying or different opinions or perspectives, but getting that all together in one piece of content and putting it out there. Like a journalist would, right? Let's just take a political journalist because we can all understand that there's two sides at least to any argument, unfortunately, in the United States. Uh, and you got to represent both equally, even maybe, maybe you know, I don't think sometimes journalists try to represent the truth uh, as well as, as opposed to both opinions, but they'll get a whole other conversation. We don't have yeah. both perspectives in that article. Yeah. And so that's yeah. the way we kind of look at it. And it's rarely as controversial as um, politics, but we, we try to cover multiple angles on a topic. And that's what we mean by uh, more uh, journalists than columnists. 
Yeah. So you are sourcing the perspectives, the stories. Um, I, I heard it said recently that in marketing, we talk about storytelling all the time. We don't talk nearly enough about story finding. And I think that that's illuminated here as opposed to uh, we're the columnist. We have our hot take. You're going to you're going to read it and we're going to try and convince you of of our perspective. Um, versus we are going to approach things like a journalist. We're going to do research out in the open, as I've heard you uh, use that phrase before. And we're going to go to the people who sit in the seats of the people we're creating content for and and not just say, hey, we've, we got a new column out. Go check it out. You're going to invite them and say, hey, we're doing a piece. We're doing some research. Um, help come contribute to it. I think for a lot of folks hearing this, they um, they may say, yeah, that makes sense. Ready to go. Let's talk about the how. But I, I think it's important to take a quick time out and say, well, why was this important for you as the CEO, for, for John um, heading up marketing at, at Databox? What, what were the things that you thought, hey, we've got to go down this path versus this path? Before we get into the tactical, I, I think we've got to talk about why is it important to go the route that you guys have? Yeah. So I would like to say that um, we do it this way because it produces better content. <laughs> we did it this way because it produces better content. And I do believe that it does produce better content. So I think it's fair to say that. But if I'm being honest about the origin story of it, it's not for that reason. Um, do you tell. Know, the, the, or, the origin story is um, for a year before I left HubSpot, I spent nine years there and I was an executive and built out the channel program, as you know. Uh, and... For the last year, I was done doing that job. I basically said, "Hey, I think I'm going to leave," and and but I want to make sure that you know the program and my team's in good hands, so I'll stick around. And so Halligan said, well, "What do you want to do?" I said, well, "Why don't you let me write on the sales blog? Like, I've done a good job building out this sales and marketing program, and so I have some stuff to share." And so I, I did that. I wrote 42 articles, long form, like really in depth, you know, stuff that came from my years of experience of of selling, of managing salespeople, of coaching salespeople, of leading sales managers, et cetera. Uh, and uh, towards the end of it, I kind of ran out of stuff to write about. I'm like, yeah, I could cover that, but it's not that interesting. And so I started reaching out to other sales uh, thought leaders, sales authors, other sales, sales management, sales practitioners and saying, hey, what are you working on? What's interesting to you? Would you like to contribute to some content I'm putting together? And I started crowdsourcing and I realized by the end of that, first few times I'm like, Oh, this is a better article. It's got multiple perspectives. And that's kind of where it came from. So then when I fast forward to when I joined Databox, which wasn't very long uh, after that period, um, I looked at our product and the value prop of our product was complicated because um, the value is that we pull data from multiple tools into one spot. And so I'm like, there's no possible way that I can build a marketing team while bootstrapping. Uh, that's an expert at HubSpot and, Google Analytics and Search Console and Facebook and Google Ads and all the other ads platforms and 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 SharpSpring and ActiveCampaign and QuickBooks and all this. So I said, all right, well, let's crowdsource it and let's start partnering with organizations that are experts at that and see what kind of information we can pull in and highlight them. The benefit to them is that they get featured and the benefit to us is that we are able to produce content that we just don't have the in-house expertise to produce ourselves. So that's how that's how it came about. I did not know that part of the story of uh, saying, hey, can I go write on the, the sales blog? Um, and I, I've been there before. Uh, I remember, um, you know, my my career journey into partnerships was kind of long and storied. It actually comes from starting with a, a journalism degree uh, similar to, to John, got into B2B sales, right? And then um, moved into marketing, joining an agency uh, between that, that shift from uh, uh, regional B2B sales to helping run a marketing agency. I, I had always been the salesperson who was excited about marketing, I think because of my journalism roots. And uh, I, I had a buddy who wanted to start a marketing agency and uh, I was like, all right, sweet, let's write some blog posts. And I started you know, talking about my passion for content marketing, but I hadn't actually done it yet, right? And I literally wrote two blog posts and was like, 
I don't have too much else to say. I'm passionate about this. Like I want to go here, but like mine was even worse than your story uh, because I hit that wall uh, much sooner. But I think no matter who we are, we're going to hit that. We're going to hit that wall. So I, I'd love to hear. It's, it's interesting. Like, I think that is a challenge with a lot of co companies that do content marketing. They hire relatively junior people to do that role who don't have a lot of life experience. Uh, do, and they're not practitioners necessarily of what they're, clients do or customers do or, or even what the company them, the, that they're hired for does. So I think it's important that journalism skills be applied to content marketing way more frequently than they are. Absolutely. Like your, your junior content marketer has never been a, it doesn't matter who you sell to a CMO, a CIO, a CTO, a CEO, a VP of sales. Otherwise they wouldn't be your junior content marketer, right? <laughs> exactly. uh, not only do they exactly. usually not have a ton of of business experience, right? Because of where they're at in their career, which is fine, but they've also never had that applicable experience to go deep and, and speak to the audience you're trying to reach. So I think you did a good job of both of, uh, pulling out both of our stories that actually illuminate the, why this is important. And it echoes, uh, some of the things we've been talking about at partner hacker. So let's talk about the, how, uh, how, how did you guys get started? You came in as CEO of, of data box. Uh, I'm, I, I don't remember kind of the timeline of, uh, was, was John there already? Did you bring him in? What were, um, tell me a little bit about that and how you guys got started building a, a marketing team that has been able to crush it with so much content and not just volumes of crap content, but like content that is driving inbound for you guys. Where did you start from day one, taking this journalistic approach? It, it, sometimes it helps to set the stage of where we're at and then work back. So we're like a quarter million yeah. sessions per month and we get about 5,500, 5,000 to 5,500 signups per month for our free product all through organic means. We don't do any paid advertising. Now, of course, there's word of mouth and dark social and all the other stuff that you can't directly uh, attribute to Google Analytics. But when you look at our Google Analytics or HubSpot Analytics, you'll see organic, right? Um, organic means, which we're growing. So all of that is through, and there's really, for most of the time that I've been at Databox, which was a joined in 2017, we've done two things. We write blog content and we've launched free um, dashboard templates that people can download, connect their date, connect, uh, their Facebook ads or HubSpot account to, and it immediately shows their HubSpot and Facebook ads data right in the dashboard. So, so the blog posts are our top of the funnel. The, the templates are kind of our offer that gets people to convert and try our free product. If they don't also just come to our product, you know, and sign up for our product. Um, so that's where we're at now. Your question was more of like um, around uh, how did we get started with that, right? Um, yeah. Right. So yeah, in 2017, 100%. I joined as CEO. It was, there was 12 of us at the time. It was me, one person that handled support and all product and engineering. It was a bit of a reboot. They had tried to go to market. Um, they, yeah. uh, they went to market. They raised a bunch of money. They tried to take, they continue to go to that market and it didn't work. And so when I joined, they were right at the, um, the, the middle of a pivot. It just pivoted um, to the, a new market. And so there was no traffic to the website, very little revenue. Um, we had some cash in the bank, uh, but not a lot. And so we had to be scrappy. Uh, and so I hired a handful of people. Uh, for the first few months, it was me writing blogs, me taking sales calls, me helping customers get onboarded until that became untenable. And then hired, ended up hiring uh, two, two people right away, uh, one more very shortly thereafter. And the one of those one of the first hires was a marketing person that was writing content, and we started doing this a little bit. We had trouble scaling it because, uh, you know, making connections with people, writing content like it, it required a process, and it, it was only so much one person could do. So we quickly hired a second person whose job was simply to reach out to experts and say, "Would you contribute to this article?" Uh, and that and that that woman's still here uh, doing that plus other things now. Um, but, uh, but so we had two people, one basically internal writer that was writing and one person that was crowdsourcing quotes for, for our content. Uh, and that's how we got started. Um, today, uh, like fast forward to today, the process, you know, we've, we've crowdsourced more than a thousand articles that way. Um, more than 30,000 people have contributed. We didn't necessarily include all of them, but 30,000 people have like filled out some kind of form or co to contribute yeah. to, at least to one of those articles. Um, and 
And now we have a much easier time <laughs> of it because we have a big list that we can go back to of people who have contributed in the previous to previous articles. Um, and we have a much higher domain authority now. So people want to contribute because they want to link from our website and mention on our website. Um, and so, uh, but the process is we, we right now we, we create a research brief, we call it. Uh, and that research brief is the angle for the article, uh, as well as who we think we want to contribute to it, as well as questions that we want to ask them. Um, we take that research brief. We sometimes actually start and just pose the questions on LinkedIn and tag a bunch of people um, to get their perspective. Uh, and we'll get like- At what point in the process are you guys putting that out on LinkedIn? Usually that's like, like the first step in the nice. research okay. is to like go and get free form thoughts from a bunch of people who have some expertise on it. Uh, then the next step is we build a survey. So you're crowdsourcing before you're crowdsourcing essentially on, on that point, right? Yeah, kind of, yes, yeah. So the writer will reference that thread uh, as well. And we actually sit there, like we try to get everybody to respond at the same time. Um, and so we sit there and ask follow-up questions. And so we have someone like myself or John or Jeremiah or someone else on the team who knows the subject, who's sitting there asking follow-up questions. And then conversations organically happen because people chime in and start asking questions too. Um, but yeah, so we crowdsource and then we build a, a formal survey in SurveyMonkey and it always has at least one open-ended question, usually two. And then there's a bunch of multiple choice questions so we can actually um, get people's, uh, we can produce like facts based off of the survey. So we'll say like 55% of marketers who do this, did it this way. Right. Um, and, and so then, then we'll send that out to our list. We actually do like cross those three to five articles a week. So it goes out to our big list. Um, we also have a small team that's reaching out to one on people one-on-one -on -one to get them to contribute. Um, and then, and then we'll, take all that research. We'll do the analysis around it. We have a person on the team that does analysis of survey results and prepares them for the writer. Uh, we also go through all the quotes that we've collected and say, all right, this one's not good. Like this person clearly has no expertise and is just spamming us because they want a link um, or, the, you know, or the opposite of like, oh, this is a really good one. Let's make sure we include this one in the article. Uh, and then we'll send it off to a writer and we have a stable of like, I, I'm not sure the exact number, but I think it's five freelance writers who are trained in our process. And they'll take all the research that we did and weave that into a, a journalist style, a journalism style article where they're, again, representing multiple perspectives. There's so much good there in, in the process and just like, okay, I, I encourage people hit that back button like two or three times uh, <laughs> to, to just take to, I'm like writing fast and furious, like the steps here. Cause you guys have just, I mean, how else do you do it with such a, uh, uh, not such a small team, but a smaller team compared to other larger organizations with tons of marketing resources that don't put out near the volume of content uh, that you guys do. And again, it's not, you know, there are teams that pump out a ton of content, but it's not, uh, it's not of the, the same value. Um, I, I particularly like the step that you guys do of kind of doing some planning, some of that pre research, doing it out in the open on LinkedIn, having someone dedicated to, uh, facilitate the, the conversations. One thing you mentioned there towards the end, Pete, was you have a, a pool of freelance writers that are trained in your process. And I think a lot of marketing teams struggle with writing resources, video resources, whatever it is. What do we, what do we outsource? What do we bring in house? Um, what, where do we find an agency that can do it repeatably? So how did you guys land on that model? Because obviously written content is a big portion of your strategy of marketing together with the people in your audience. Um, how did you land on that? Maybe did you try some other ways to, to fill that writing need? What worked, what didn't? We initially had an internal marketer doing all the writing and it just didn't, it didn't scale. It was kind of dependent on just one person's ability to, to work fast and produce content, but also, you know, be interested enough in the topic and disciplined enough to do the research. So we tried that. Um, and I don't know if it was the person or the processes we had at the time or whatever, it just didn't seem to work. And so we said, well, how can we do this? It is time consuming. And if you're doing 10 other things to, you know, cause our marketing team does other things too. It's hard to like, just sit down for four hours, eight hours and like bang out a good article. And so we just said, all right, well, let's outsource it to freelancers. If we're doing all the research up front, 
then we can kind of feed them what the angle of the article is and a lot of the meat of the article. And it actually can be really efficient for them because in most scenarios, they have to go do the research on their own for a client. Um, and so we're saving them a lot of time. And we've actually been able to outsource it to really, I think, high quality writers um, and do it quite cost effectively because their job is to take all the stuff we we put together for them and, and weave it together. They don't have to do that research that they usually have to do. Yeah, which makes it more efficient for them. So probably a little bit more cost effective for you guys because you're not uh, having to find writers who then have to incorporate all of that research time. And you're you're getting the the quality, you know, because I think the same thing we said earlier in the conversation of a junior marketer going to Google, doing that research, trying to communicate to someone who sits in a buyer seat that they've never sat in. We could just go down that that same path and hit the same wall with a freelance writer as with the the problem we were describing earlier with that junior content marketer, right? Right. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So I, I thought it was interesting that before you guys started adding more writers, you had someone dedicated most or all of her time to running the outreach. And I, I don't yeah. think that that is usually... Uh, emphasized enough within a, a marketing team, even if they are doing, you know, joint webinars and other partner marketing, uh, that emphasis of how are we going to systematize our outreach, have someone who can really do this well. So uh, curious, what has, what has worked there? What would you encourage other marketing teams to either carve out a role for, or look for that expertise and dedicate some of their time to the outreach? I imagine once you have a contributor, you have a system to maybe flag them what they've contributed to and where they might contribute to something in the future. Talk to me about like that outreach role, the follow-up and some of the things that that person's responsible for that others might be able to replicate within their marketing team. Yeah. Um, we, I think that the number of rep reps that we had, like, you know, like in sports, if you do a lot of reps in the, in you swing the bat a lot, right here, kick the ball a lot. You're going to get good at it. I think that's really been the secret to uh, that, like being productive around this is that we, we've done it so many times. Not only do we build the list, but we have like a reputation of it and people are like, Oh yeah, I read your articles. I'll contribute. Right. Um, and so there's, there's this almost semi virality, nothing I can measure, but semi virality around recruiting contributors. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't say like we, we, so we've actually talked about building out a database uh, and, and like tagging, oh, these are Facebook ads experts and these are HubSpot experts, but we haven't gotten that far. But what we did do from the very beginning is we used SurveyMonkey uh, to run, uh, to capture all this stuff. And so whenever we are trying to, like if we're struggling to get enough contributors to an article or a, a longer form survey that we're doing, which is more often, um, we will go back and look at people. Okay, we're, we got this Facebook ad survey that we want to run and it's got 30 questions. Like we're, we're going to have to work hard at it. So let's go back and like look at all the people that have filled out any article or contributed to any article that we've completed on Facebook ads and say, hey, would you please go contribute to this survey? We're trying to create a, a you know, an informative uh, study of Facebook ads and you should be, you should find it valuable. Um, so that that simple process of like looking back at what people contributed before and reusing that small list and sending more targeted messages is key has been key. Well, I, I think that's actually an encouragement to anyone who hasn't built out uh, this framework like you guys have, which I don't know of anyone who has done it at the scale that, that you guys have, even no, if they are like you know, in the beginning, we used to talk a little bit about it and people were like, Oh, I'm going to do that. It's yeah. brilliant. And then they try and then they give up on the first one. <laughs> What, why do you think that is? Because it requires so much persistence to, to do it. And it's it's hard to like, there's a lot of steps there. You got to structure the questions well. That's not a natural thing for a lot of people. I think you might be good at writing, but you might not be good at interviewing. You have to be really curious in a way to like really think about what's the right question. You got to do research to formulate the questions. You got to read content related to that to formulate that question. So there's a lot of steps to it to get it right. And then, you know, you're going to, you got to ask 20 people to get, maybe five or six responses. So if you want 20 or 30 responses, you're going to be asking, you know, a hundred people or so. So you're sending lots of one-on-one -on -one messages in the beginning and, and, you know, it gets frustrating. I think for a marketer that's used to <laughs> sitting down with uh, a blank page or interviewing one expert and getting some kind of getting something together. So uh, most people, most people give up. Um, but yeah. 
but which is we've also started doing this with our partners where we actually write the research brief together and we handle all the hard part. Um, we give them an opportunity to highlight their own expertise in it really prominently and host the LinkedIn discussion and um, and then write co like follow up content that that for their article. So we're doing a lot of the hard work so that they can they can use this as a networking tool for themselves. Yeah, that that part cannot be overstated of the the networking aspect of it, right? Of uh, even those contributors, there's the virality of the content, but then there's also that relationship that you build because you're reaching into your target audience and you're marketing with people who do sit in that seat versus the junior marketer who hasn't. Guess what? That person is now aware of, has some affinity toward DataBox that they didn't have previously. I think that's where... It, kind of what you're talking about here, the the marketer has to start thinking like a journalist to to ask questions. They also have to start thinking a little bit like a salesperson. Hey, I'm not going to get a hundred percent reply rate. And there's a relationship to nurture here, not just the content that comes out of the other side. And I've I've always thought about that, but I think that partially comes from that journalism and sales background. Yeah, no, it like so. I you've probably seen some of my rants about um, how I I think it's a. Re a ridiculous thing that we hire very also very junior people and we and we t give them uh you know they're the least skilled least knowledgeable uh least experienced people and we put them in a sales development role where their job is to go initiate a dialogue with a ridiculously busy senior executive right at the prospect company um and and and, and not that book 30 minutes so that they can be pitched like the chances of success it's like, you know, it's like asking your little league or to go and, uh, you know, go into the major leagues and try to hit a 90, 90 miles per hour fastball. Uh, they're just not going to be able to do that. Uh, and so one of the benefits of this process is that you're stepping back a little bit from this idea that I have to be pitching everybody all the time. And I'm engaging my prospects in a collaborative effort of learning from each other, which as an, a busy executive, like if you can help me learn something that's relevant to my business and also maybe give me some visibility for things that I'm doing, uh, like that's, that's really like for a good portion of executives, that's a big motivator. And so, so we initiate a lot of dialogue with a lot of really important people, uh, really senior executives of amazing companies just by asking them to contribute to an article. And it's, you know, it's a really light lift for them. Um, they probably already said these words 500 times or even written the words 500 times in some way. Um, and, and, uh, and yes, it starts at dialogue and they're usually appreciative. Case in point, this is just fresh in my mind because it was just a, a number of weeks ago. I don't want to toot my own horn here, but like uh, you and I had been connected on LinkedIn for not that long, uh, engaging a, a little bit. I knew John previously for, for a few years, had been on his podcast, Metrics and Chill. Shout out to Metrics and Chill. Check that out. Um, and I, we were starting a new webinar series at, at Teamwork focused on agencies, there's overlap there between our two, our two companies and the focus on agencies. And when I reached out to you said, Hey, do you want to be a webinar guest? It was, I think we could use this LinkedIn post that, that you did to be kind of the outline for the webinar. And one of the things you mentioned to me is like, Hey, you're going to take, you took the time to identify something I already said, as opposed to saying, Hey, come be on our webinar, come up with a deck, design the deck, do all of those sorts of things. So, uh, I think that's something that other folks can, can learn from. What are other things you guys do in the, in the outreach that doesn't make it seem like such a big ask? Cause you guys have been doing that a lot now. And I, I think probably refine that process a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, your, your example, and I, and I've given you public kudos already for this, but yeah, I'll repeat it. I think you made it easy for me to do webinar and I say no to webinar after webinar. Like it just, the amount of time I know it would take me to sit down, block off every and block out all distractions and put together a good deck. That's, that's hard for me. And we don't, we don't have webinars as like a marketing activity. So there's no one else in the company building that stuff, uh, right now. Um, and so you made it so easy. You're like, hey, I'm going to build the deck for you. I love this framework that you came. That framework was obviously in support of my own business objectives because I'm publishing it because I want people to follow that framework. And so you made that so easy. And I think that's, that is a really important thing to think about when you're reaching out to 
somebody who's a busy executive, whether it's from a sales or a marketing perspective, you have to think about the, the amount of value you're delivering for the amount of effort that is required. And our process requires a very little amount of effort. It's not a huge amount of value, but it's a decent amount of value. It's a link from a new domain that's valuable. Yours, I think, was uh, a little bit more effort, but not much more, honestly. And the value was really high. And I think that's a great way to look at it is like, what's the value for the effort? One of the other things we, like I mentioned earlier that we're doing is um, uh, the LinkedIn conversations. That's really light value. And it's actually a really light effort for them because they just have to like log into LinkedIn at a specific time and answer a few questions uh, and learn, you know, participate that. But it also then is good marketing for them. I think con commenting on LinkedIn is great marketing for yourself because that exposes your comments to someone else's uh, else's network. But it also is good nurturing for the people who are already following you because they're um, they're now, um, you know, seeing how you respond to other comments and reading that. So uh, that's a light lift for a little decent amount of effort. The other thing, of course, is is podcast being a guest on podcasts, like inviting your prospect or whatever to be a guest on podcasts. I know you do this, uh, obviously. And then I was talking to a guy, Ryan Staley, uh, yesterday, who does like sixteen podcast recordings a month by himself, uh, wow. and then that flows into uh, business opportunities for him because he's interviewing the people that he, he does provide services to the profile of the person that he provides services to. And so I think and th and that's a lot of value to someone, right. To, to show off you know, their expertise and talk about their business for an hour for your hundreds or thousands of listeners. So, uh, so yeah, like thinking about it from that perspective. Yeah, absolutely. You just, you just prefaced a future episode uh, here because I'm going to have my buddy James Carberry on the show marketing together here. Uh, and that was, that was the process we ran at Sweetfish. I, I joined that agency that does podcast production, became the host of a daily show. And part of the reason we did a daily show was exactly the same thing that, uh, that Ryan's doing. There is a volume of interviews because it creates a volume of content, but it also gives you a lot of at bats in talking to and getting introduction to, uh, the people that you want to serve. Cause I was interviewing VPs of marketing and CMOs and we'd get done with the podcast and they'd say, Oh, I see you guys do podcast production. Who can I talk to? I'm like, Hey, yeah. you just met him. Let's schedule right. a call right now. I, yep. I didn't have to do any bait and switch. So we'll talk more about that strategy, um, in, in a few episodes. So make sure you're subscribed. If this is your first time listening to marketing together, I'm glad you also brought up the, the LinkedIn piece, uh, Pete, because, uh, John reached out to me. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about podcasting, but just because that was the topic of the article, uh, you know, John reached out to me, Hey, you spent four years at Sweetfish doing podcast production. We're doing a roundup on LinkedIn of how you measure podcast success for a B2B brand. A great example of people with differing opinions, different, different, yeah, differing really perspectives. Scary. I think, uh, the, the guys at Wistia, yeah, the guys from Wistia chimed in. I, I jumped in, tagged a few of my friends over over at Sweetfish. And some of the tactical things that made it easy for me to be a contributor and see it valuable. One, I understand the value of commenting on LinkedIn and how you know you get visibility that way. It's something I've actually been I baked into a training yeah. course for our yeah, for our sales team, because it's different than a lot of other social platforms. Oftentimes you leave a comment, it's just in a vacuum, right? It actually, commenting gets you in people's feeds, right? And so if you're going to use this strategy of um, doing some research or getting some contributors to, uh, to pile on on LinkedIn, if they don't quite understand that like you and I do, explain that to them and, and show that value. The other thing John did was like, he put a block on my calendar. He was like, Hey, it's going to be Tuesday morning. We're going to post it. Here's what I'm asking of you is, you know, leave an early, uh, engagement and, uh, share your thoughts. So one, I was already prepped a little bit Two, I had a, a time block and three, it wasn't a big, uh, lift as far as effort back to your other point of it's something I've talked about a, a ton before. And I had a little prep, I had a little block. Um, and I think that's important. Um, also LinkedIn, uh, you know, I, I can't speak to the algorithm specifically, but I think that if you're tagging a lot of people and they don't engage with that post, it's likely going to be seen negatively in that post, uh, the reach is going to suffer. So you also, if you're doing that sort of stuff on LinkedIn, you just need to plan and prep and give people uh, a heads up the way that you guys do. 
Yeah, I think you got you can't be tagging like yeah you can't go tag like you know the CEO of a bunch CEOs of a bunch of Fortune 500 companies and expect them to stop what they're doing and just comment on your post right you I think you either need to have a relationship with people and um, that you're you know you're you're commenting you're already engaged with them in dialogue previously might be multiple times maybe it's a person that you know well and they know you well and you're you're always commenting back and forth. Like it's either that or yeah, you got to give them a heads up and say, I'm going to tag you in this post. I really like your perspective. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that's important. Uh, some people objected. We would reach out to them. They're like, Oh, I don't, that, that feels like I'm spamming the LinkedIn algorithm. But uh, I think we did it with really, really good intent in terms of like, we really want their perspective and we're going to put it, we're going to put resources behind taking their perspective and others' perspectives and putting a good article together for people that's, you know, that includes their perspective and is, you know, authoritative. Um, and that one's a great example of that podcast one. We had some really great people on that. Yeah, there were tons of comments. And I think that's a good call out for anybody saying, I learned a crap ton from that article. Myself. Hey, <laughs> right. And I think it's a good call out too, to, uh, you know, cause people rail on, you know, the engagement pod strategy or just dropping your, your spam yeah. tagging people or dropping a link to your post into a, you know, Slack channel to get clicks like paying for podcast downloads, um, in, um, in some other far flung parts of the world, this is, this is actually doing LinkedIn collaboratively, right? It's not spam tagging. It's, Hey, let's make a concerted effort to show up on LinkedIn at a given time. It's actually more social. And it's a great example of, of marketing together. Um, well, Pete, you mentioned, uh, as we rounded out today, I want to give people some, some tactical advice. So you mentioned one of the, the pitfalls, if people have tried this, you've seen, they just don't have the persistence to, to see it through, which is why you guys have gone from doing this for yourselves and now extending it out and kind of doing it for your partners, yeah. um, and data box together. Um, but what are some of the other ways that you think folks might be able to, to get over that hump? What could they do to, to not, to go down this path and at least see some results? Maybe it's not thousands of articles in the way this, that you guys have, but what would, what would you offer to them as advice? Yeah. I think the first thing to think about is pick a topic that's really important to your business or your prospects. Um, because you already have your presumably your sales team talking to prospects all day. Um, you're going to write about that topic anyways. And then think, think in terms of maybe doing a survey as opposed to just a roundup. Um, but make it a short survey. Make it a handful of multiple choice questions and one or two open-ended questions. Um, and then just say, all right, we know that we need to get at least 30 to 50 responses to this. Um, but let's just get started. Um, once you start getting a handful of responses, you can take some of their quotes and use that to pop. You can publish social posts with their quote and say, Hey, we're looking for more as perspectives, or you can use their insight as a way to start a dialogue on LinkedIn. Um, you can highlight that in a newsletter that you're putting out. You can stop and invite them on your podcast, right? There's different ways to, to, um, continue to just have that dialogue because you're going to have, you're going to be pulling different perspectives and you can just keep communicating different perspectives as you continue to collect and recruit people to contribute. Um, once you have 30, 50 people, you could treat it kind of like a poll would be and say, Hey, I've polled 50 people um, on this topic and 30% of them say X and 70% of them say, why, what's the correct one? Like, why does 70% do that? And you can use that, start to use that data to continue the dialogue. The key is like, you're, you're exploring the topic out in the open. Um, and you're, you're engaging with people along the way. And if you think of it that way, like you don't need to collect 50 responses in one week. So you can get your blog post published. You can think about, I'm going to collect 50 responses over the next three months and I'm going to put the, or I'm a hundred responses. I'm going to put together a really good piece of content, but along the way, I'm going to tease people with stuff I'm learning uh, about that, about that topic. I might even share a story that's based on my own primary, my own firsthand experience, right. But connected to that topic. So that's my advice is pick that topic. That's really important that, that you know, the data will be ultimately valuable for you. The other thing is like, we just did a survey where we did 250 responses where we surveyed uh, we got 250 responses where we surveyed um, B2B marketers on exactly what metrics they're reporting, 
um, actually, um, uh, how they do it, how frequently they do it, who's doing it, how long it takes them, et cetera. And this is, there's like 20 insights there that we'll use, not just in our marketing, but our selling process, in our product marketing, et cetera. So if you think about the crowdsourcing from the perspective of how you can use that content over and over again, then you probably won't quit. That, that is a great way to round out the conversation uh, here today because I think it reinforces what what we were talking about, uh, you know, a few months back at, at PLX and in partner led everything by reaching into the community, creating content with them by marketing together, then it has these other impacts, those partnerships with those contributors it's now impacting sales and impacting product. And, you know, when I started in my partnerships role that I'm currently in six months ago, uh, I, I just started creating content with people that fit our, our ICP agency owners. And pretty soon the, the product team was saying, Oh, wait, you had that conversation. Can you, can you share that gong snippet? Oh, you recorded that. Can I, can I have that? Um, it, it goes even further than just the marketing efforts. So, um, I think that's a great way to round it out. Pete, this has been fantastic. Every interaction we've had has been awesome, whether it's been LinkedIn, a webinar, now a podcast. Um, so thank you so much for spending time with me today. I really appreciate it, man. You're welcome. Appreciate it. It's always fun to tell the story. And obviously I'm a collaborator, so I enjoy the collaboration with you and I invite others to collaborate with, with me and my team as well. So thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. If you are not following Databox, uh, Pete, uh, look him up, Pete Caputa and John Benini and the rest of the Databox team, just so much content. Uh, I, I hit the notification bell on your LinkedIn profile a while back and I don't know if I'm regretting it cause I'm seeing you so often, but I'm not because it's always good stuff. Uh, I really appreciate it. So follow him, hit that notification bell. Thank you. I did a zoom call with an agency owner yesterday and, um, and, and for, I, for some reason I said, let's go look at LinkedIn. I'll show you, I was showing him something. And he opened his LinkedIn account and I was, my most recent post was his top, top thing in his feed. So, uh, and I hear that all the time. So the more frequently you publish and the more engagement you get, uh, it's really an amazing opportunity. It's, uh, I wish I had discovered maybe a year ago, but I think it's a relatively new phenomenon on LinkedIn. Everybody should be publishing on LinkedIn. If you're not, you're, you're probably missing the easiest marketing, B2B marketing channel there is right now. Absolutely. We'll have to do a, another episode here on marketing together completely about, uh, you know, LinkedIn, uh, because I think there are a lot of teams for as, as long as it's been a, a channel for B2B marketing teams, there's still a lot that are not getting what they could out of it. Um, Pete, again, appreciate your time. It's been fantastic, man. If you're listening to this, uh, thank you for spending time with Pete and I today. And remember, we go further faster when we're marketing together.